So we'll go ahead and get started. So on behalf of the Department of Justice, Division of Law Enforcement, Bureau of Gambling Control, I'd like to welcome you all to this regulation workshop to discuss the issue of rotation of the player-dealer um, position. So my name is Stephanie Shimazu. I'm the director of the Bureau of Gambling Control. And I think Suzanne will introduce everyone else as we move along. But just to give some background, this is the fourth of seven workshops that um, we have held and will be holding in various cities throughout the state. So we chose locations to try and make convenient um, and accessible for those who want to participate and provide input on the issue. So the Bureau looks forward to hearing everyone's thoughts today. And I understand that individuals may feel very strongly about this issue. But please know that today's workshop will be conducted in a civil collegial manner. I believe that while we can have opposing views and opinions sometimes from one another, it's possible to have civil, constructive, and professional discussions. So I ask that we keep this in mind throughout the day, or the day, the morning. Um, so we cannot tolerate discussions or behavior that are discourteous or disrespectful to others. Additionally, with so many people interested in participating in this process and wishing to present input on this topic, it will be important for everyone to keep their comments brief. We're gonna give everyone five minutes and we will wait until you have completed your presentation before asking for any clarification or any questions so we won't cut into your allotted time. Um, if you've already submitted your comments to the Bureau and have new input today, you may wish to concentrate on that new input. Also, if you have brought your comments in a letter to present to the Bureau today, please note that copies will be posted to the Bureau's regulation website, as will any other written comments already submitted or that will be submitted during this process. Again, with the volume of comments that we expect to receive, it wasn't economically feasible or environmentally friendly to distribute in hard copy form to everyone. So a note, the, uh, the regulatory process can be lengthy. However, that is in part to ensure that all stakeholders have an opportunity uh, to voice their concerns and opinions. The Bureau is committed to ensuring that the regulatory, regulatory process is followed and ensuring that all stakeholders are heard. And as a reminder, this is a workshop. So we are in the informal stages of the regulatory process and we will continue with the informal process until such time that we're comfortable, that we've received, reviewed, and analyzed all your input and opinions. Uh, we also strongly encourage you to provide any suggested language for the proposed regulation during this informal process. Today's workshop also includes three issues related to the issue of rotation of the player dealer position, the Bureau asks that, in addition to any general comments that you may have, that attendees focus some of their comments on addressing those issues outlined in the agenda. The ultimate goal of these workshops is to develop a regulation change which provides clarity to the existing statutory provisions for licensees and direction on how to incorporate these into game rules with the statutory framework in mind. And with that, I will turn things over to the moderator for today's workshop. Good morning, my name is Suzanne George, and I am the Regulations Coordinator for the Bureau of Gambling Control. In addition to Director Shimazu, joining me today are Yolanda Morrow, Assistant Director of our Licensing Section, Nate Diwali, Assistant Director of our Compliance and Enforcement Section, Deputy Attorney General Brent Joe with the Bureau of Gambling Control. It is uh, nearly 9.10 on Tuesday, January the 15th, 2019. The Bureau of Gambling Control has scheduled this regulations workshop at the California State University San Marcos in San Marcos, California. This workshop is scheduled to discuss the issue of the rotation of the player dealer position. Notice and an agenda of this workshop have been previously published to the Bureau's regulations webpage and sent in an email to interested parties. The agenda and participation guidelines are available at the sign-in. Looks like this. So if you need to go and get one, please feel free. A few housekeeping items. Um, the restrooms are out this door and down at the end of the hallway to the right. Today's workshop is scheduled for a total of three hours and may include a short break. The entire workshop discussion will be recorded. Um, if you did not have an opportunity to sign in, there are two separate sign-in sheets in the back at the entrance of the door. Uh, one for um, those folks who would like to be included on the Bureau's distribution list, and one for those who have um, brought comments to present today. In the interest of time, the Bureau will limit speakers to five minutes and comments mu um, must be limited to the issue of the rotation of the player-dealer position as noticed for this workshop. 
Other issues or regulations will not be covered topics in this workshop. When your name is called to present comments, we ask that you um, come to the front of the room to this uh, microphone. Please state and spell your name and please identify the organization you represent. Also, if you have written comments that you would like to present today, you can uh, give them to me. All right, so as for our workshop, workshop format, we have changed up the format just a little bit from the previous three. The first portion of the workshop is to receive, to receive any legal comments, proposed text suggestions, and discussion about the actual content of um, the regulation concerning the player rotation of the player dealer position and what it should include. In an effort to focus discussions on certain issues that will be addressed in the regulation, the first portion of today's workshop is to address the following three issues. And these issues are also outlined on the agenda. Issue number one, discussion of how the mere offer of the player dealer position may or may not satisfy the requirement that the position must be continuously and systematically rotated amongst each of the participants during the play of the game. Issue two, discussion of what the game rules should provide if during the play of the game no one accepts the player-dealer position. Issue three, discussion of what it means to maintain or operate a bank. After the issue discussion portion of the workshop, the Bureau will next call those speakers who wish to present general comments concerning the rotation of the player-dealer position. Now for an introdu uh, introduction of the topic. In 1984, the California Constitution was amended with the Voter Initiative Proposition 37 at the November 6, 1984 general election. Proposition 37, also known as the California State Lottery Act of 1984, added provisions of government code and amended the California Constitution, authorizing the establishment of a statewide lottery in California. Proposition 37 also added a prohibition in California of gambling casinos, the type that exist in Nevada and New Jersey. Specific to this prohibition, Proposition 37 added Section 19E to the California Constitution which reads the legislature has no power to authorize and shall prohibit casinos of the type currently operating in Nevada and New Jersey. Until this proposition was enacted, casino gambling was prohibited within California by a statute, not by the Constitution. Chapter 10 of the Penal Code contains code sections specific to gambling, sections 330 through 337Z. Penal Code Section 330, first enacted in 1872, prohibited six specifically named games or any banking game played with cards, dice, or any other device for money, checks, credit, or any other representative of value. This section was amended four times since 1872, extending the list of specifically named games and changing the penalty and sentencing structure. In 2000, Section 330.11 was, was added to the Penal Code. And for your convenience, that section is actually listed on the agenda. There is not, however, any text within the California Constitution or the statutes of California that define what constitutes continuously and systematic rotation of the player-dealer position. The California Gambling Control Act in Business and Professions Code Section 19826, Subdivision G, assigns the Department of Justice the responsibility of approving the play of any controlled game in gambling establishments within California, including placing restrictions and limitations on how a controlled game may be played. The Act also mandates the adoption of regulations which provide for the approval of game rules by the Bureau to ensure fairness to the public and compliance with state laws. The topic of the rotation of the player-dealer position is now open for public discussion. First on the agenda for the topic issues. Um, so again, topic issues. <laughs> the first speaker called from the sign-in list. And just as another housekeeping item, um, when your time is getting close to uh, completion, you will see uh, Nate Diwali with a sign. He will show you. <laughs> and then when your time is up, we will thank you for your presentation. All right, first is uh, Lori Coons. 
And again, remember these are on the topic issues, please. Are you going to be giving uh, time to MP that's not on the topic? Yes, but after the topic issues have been discussed okay, in the speakers. Thank you. Speaking are you speaking on the topic issues or would you like to wait? I'm sorry? Yes. Mr. Rob Gretz. No, but there will be. Thank you. Uh, my name is Rob Gretz, and I'm with San Ysidro Health. San Ysidro Health is a nonprofit health center providing health care to those in need in South Bay, El Cajon, and surrounding areas. We provide health care services to over 95,000 patients annually. Mr. Gretz, yes, are you presenting on the topic issues? Um, I'm more or less just kind of stating why, you know, we feel that, you know, any negative impact okay. to this may negatively impact us. So okay, that's with all due respect, we're going to cover the topic issues okay. first, but when we get to the general comment issues, we will we'll call in the order. Thank you. Yes. Okay, so um, if you have signed in on the yellow sheet and you are prepared to talk about the topic issues which are listed on the agenda, please raise your hand. Okay, so we have Mr. Big Knife. Okay. All right, so um, I, I know Mark Collegian, are you going to be speaking on the topic issues? Okay. Okay, so um, if you are going to be speaking on the topic issues, would you please come to the front of the room? We have plenty of empty seats. We appreciate your patience. We're kind of having to adjust. You can go ahead. Thank you. All right, so um, when you are, when you're ready to come and present your comments, please state your name and uh, who you represent. Again, we're not going to be able to take you in the order of sign-in because we have to adjust a little bit. So feel free. Come. Good morning. Um, Good morning. I'm David Cato, D-A-V-I-D-K-A-T-O, and I'm with LE Gaming. Um, when I graduated from USC in 2001, I never imagined my career path would lead me here in front of you today. The job at the card room was supposed to be temporary, something to get by while I figured out my career. Somewhere along the way, it became my career, and I am grateful for the opportunities the industry has afforded me to provide a good life for my wife and kids. Now that life appears to be in jeopardy, and my question is why. In 17 years in 11 different card rooms from Sacramento to the East Bay, Los Angeles, and now San Diego, I've never witnessed a player denied the opportunity to take their turn as a player dealer. This happens every day at every place I've ever worked. <clears throat> in fact, at my two most recent accounts, we alternate on several tables um, taking turns as a player dealer. Uh, it seems to me that players should not be penalized for deciding not to exercise their option to take the player dealer position. So why is this an issue now? Who is being harmed? Who is being exploited? What was the impetus behind the review of our games and what necessitated these proposed changes? Maybe the better question is who benefits from the changes? Because it is not the patrons, it is not the cities where card rooms operate, it is not the card rooms or their business partners, not the, and it's certainly not the hardworking people that chose to make their lives in the industry. Our governing bodies should look to act in the best interests of its citizens to protect us from harm, to protect our livelihoods, to promote the common good. That does not seem to be happening here. Thank you. Good morning and thank you for holding this workshop. My name is Jeff Butler, it's B-U-T-L-E-R. And I want to address the three topics in order. The first, oh sorry, I represent the Yochidihi Wintu Nation. And the first topic is a discussion of how the mere offer of the player dealer position may or may not satisfy the requirements of Penal Code Section 330.11. And I have three things to say about that. First, 
the Bureau's own agenda answers the question, because if you look at the quoted section, it says, and it's just simply quoting what 330.11 says, that the position must be continuously and systematically rotated. It doesn't say anything about must be offered for rotation. It says it must rotate. That is actual rotation. The second point that I'd like to make with respect to this first topic is that the sole source of the offer of rotation is the now discredited 2007 Lytle letter. I think we all know why it's been discredited, but even the Bureau in 2014 accused Mr. Lytle of wrongful conduct, which in part relates to the issuance of the letter because he was negotiating with card rooms while he was still the chief of the Bureau. At that time, it was the, the Division of Gambling Control. And Mr. Lytle has since uh, resigned in, uh, his licenses, and uh, there's been, I think, a judgment entered against him. Um, in 2016, February 2016, we met with Attorney General Kamala Harris, and she even admitted during that meeting that the Lytle letter was of uh, questionable provenance. The third thing I'd like to say with respect to the first topic is that consistent with the notion that there must be actual rotation, the law, besides Penal Code Section 330.11, that is in addition to, says there must be actual rotation. Now, I brought a, K, a copy of the Huntington Park decision here. And in Huntington Park, uh, the court held that Pai Gao is not a banking game played there because, and I quote, the dealer position continually and systematically rotates among each of the participants. That was an actual factual finding that was made with respect to that case. So the basis of the case was that in that context, that is where the position of the dealer continually and systematically rotates among each of the participants, there was no problem. Because again, at that point, it would have been a non-banking game. If you look at the Oliver decision, the same thing. Oliver found that the New Jack was an illegal banking game because, and I quote, in New Jack, the player-dealer position does not have to rotate among the players. If the other players decline to accept the player-dealer position, one player can act as a player-dealer for repeated hands. Because the rules permit such an occurrence, we hold New Jack is a banking game and therefore, as presently constituted, prohibited under Penal Code Section 330. We have to keep in mind that at the time that these two cases were decided, 330.11 did not exist. The second point in the Bureau's agenda is, dis uh, sorry, discussion of what the game rules should provide if during the play of a game no one accepts a player dealer position. And I think there's only one conclusion that we can reach based on what 330.11 and Oliver and Huntington Park uh, provide, which is there can be no further game. If there is no actual rotation, the game must stop. Otherwise, you have what we have now at the card rooms, which is banked games. And I don't think anybody has ever argued that there are not banked games. And finally, the last issue in the agenda is essentially what is a bank. And I say uh, from a quote from the uh, Huntington Park case that it's simply taking on all comers and paying all winners and collecting from all losers. And it does not matter who it is that is doing that. Thank you. Good morning, thank you for taking the time to hear us today and also for making us drive three hours in the rain to, to speak. Um, I am Jennifer Bustamante, I represent myself. I'm a resident of the city of Chula Vista. I am not employed by the card room, um, but I am very involved in the community. I have worked at City Hall, served as, community, as a as housing community commissioner, operated my own small business, and volunteered with dozens of community organizations, including the, I'm on the board of the South County Economic Development Council. So I get to see the impact that the, that the Seven Mile Casino has, has made in our community, um, both through jobs, economic development, 
capital investment in the community in the Bayfront. I'm, I'm sure you are aware of what that location was like before their presence and what it is today. Um, I wish we had more businesses like Seven Mile Casino making a commitment to elevate their industry, their employees and the community. The location is upscale. The employees are the most in, have the most integrity at all times, and I visit the location several times for their restaurant, for their bar, for fundraisers that are held there, not just card games. The Bureau could not have picked a more inconvenient time and location for this forum. The, look, the Seven Mile Casino is very far away from here, and you, are, and you are robbed of the opportunity to see what that community is like because of them. Um, in my opinion, there is no other Chula Vista-based business that has done as much to be thoughtful and impactful in the community. They have, not, um, they have made sure every corner of their impact touches the lives of their employees, their community, their guests, their, the, the nonprofits that are um, in Chula Vista. They opened their doors continuously to community and host receptions. They took an area that was blighted, completely blighted, full of homeless, trash, um, crime, and they have turned it around. Because it's such a regulated industry, there is high security at all times. I believe in one situation they helped the FBI catch someone because of their cameras. Um, let's be frank, those who are pressuring you to consider changes will not be affected by this. This is pocket change for them and will be business as usual for them. It's our city and those employed at the card rooms who will feel the impact for sure. Our community organizations and the city will be the ones that are being hurt. Please let our city have this opportunity to continue work with a business who cares, who truly cares, in a day and time where it's all about the money, about the penal code 0333. I'm not an attorney, but I do be, live in that city. I have, and I've been, I, I was raised there. So I see, I've seen the change, the impact that they have had, and I urge you to please take that into heavy consideration. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Jane Zerby. I'm an attorney here today representing the Paula Band of Mission Indians in North San Diego County and the United Auburn Indian Community in Northern California. First, we'd like to acknowledge the concerns that have been expressed by those working in the cardroom industry, both at prior workshops, and I know that will be expressed later today. Their words are heard and um, we wanted to acknowledge that. Second, we wanted to address the three questions you've posed for this workshop. We've, we have submitted um, on behalf of the Paula Band and UAIC written comments. I think that all three are answered in those written comments, so I'll briefly uh, address the three. First, is the mere offer enough? Uh, we agree with the former uh, Bureau Chief Wayne Quint's February 2016 notification that the mere offer is not enough. We think the Oliver case clearly, uh, and we actually attach that to our comments, clearly speaks for itself in saying that the mere fact that in the New Jack game, the position w maybe wouldn't rotate for two hands rendered it a banking game. We also think that the plain language of Section 330 answers the question by saying both continuously and systematically rotate, as well as the dealer position doesn't need to have to be taken by every player if the Bureau finds that a bank can't be operating by other means given the game rules. And we think that clearly speaks to the issue as well. And then finally, we'd point out that there were legislative efforts in 2008 to change the law to say that mere offer was enough and that failed. Going to your next question, what should the game rules provide if nobody does accept the offer? We think the answer is the game needs to terminate. The, name, the game needs to be over and there needs to be very clear indicia that the game is over. We'll follow up in writing as well on that point. Third, what is the definition of banking game? We think that's been clearly defined by the California Supreme Court in the HREE versus Davis case that went back to the long line, the Huntington case, the Oliver case, a long line of California cases, but it was the Supreme Court of California that held that banking game is when one player or entity participates in the action as the one against the many, taking on all comers, paying all winners, and collecting from all losers, doing so through a fund generally called the bank. And in the HGRE case, the court went on further to say it doesn't matter if it's the house or another entity that is that bank. So we thank you for the opportunity to comment today, and we will also be providing additional written comments.
Uh, good morning. I'm Scott Crowell. I'm a lawyer. I represent the Rincon Band of Lusanio Indians and the Santa Inez Shumash Band. Um, and I want to inject an issue that I don't believe uh, has gotten a fair part of the discussion up to date, and that is going to the underlying constitutionality of the statute. Uh, Ms. Zerbe just uh, spoke about the HERE decision, uh, HERE versus Davis in 2000 or 1999. Um, just a bit of a history lesson, and the, part of my concern about what I see, you know, of people being concerned about, about their jobs and their welfare is, um, you know, the tribes tried this. Um, uh, in the early 1990s, the mid-1990s, the tribes were offering blackjack at their facilities um, uh, where they maintained a player's pool to, uh, to Take in, all the, take in all the losses and pay out all the winnings. Uh, and they wrote that player's pool into the statutory initiative, Proposition 5, in 1997. The ink wasn't dry on the tribe's victory in Prop 5 before HERE filed a writ of mandate action in the state Supreme Court that Missouri was talking about. And we had a statute that defined bank game as not including player pool bank game, and the California Supreme Court said, nice try, that's still a banked game. If the, it doesn't matter if it's a house bank game, or a player banked game, or a TPP banked game, it's a bank game, and therefore violates the California Constitution. And that's why the California tribes worked with Governor Davis to write up Proposition 5, um, Proposition 1A, and put the compacts together pursuant to Proposition 1A, which was an amendment to the Constitution to allow tribes, and only tribes, to play banked games. So when we talk about the statute and how do we make the statute work, um, you know, I, I, believe, I think you've got a clear record that what's currently being done doesn't even meet the statute. But part of the discussion and part of your deliberations in figuring out how to go forward should be looked to be, should, you should look at the underlying constitutionality of the statute, because it's no more constitutional than Proposition 5 was as, as, uh, as promoted by the tribes and passed by the people in 1997. That's not been part of the discussion. It needs to be. With all due respect, the statute's unconstitutional. A player bank game, regardless of its continu continuous rotation, regardless of, of, of it being in the player or a TPPP, is a bank game and unconstitutional under the California Constitution. Thank you. How are you? I'm Kyle Kirkland uh, from the California Gaming Association, K-Y-L-E-K-I-R-K-L-A-N-D. And I'm speaking on behalf of the California Gaming Association and the industry. Um, I'd just like to say thank you for having the, these and the other workshops. This is the fourth of seven, and we appreciate the opportunity to come before you folks and, and make ourselves heard. Um, we have prepared it, and we appreciate the list that you've presented to us of the legal issues. I'm not, um, with respect to those, I'd like you to know that as we did with advertising, as we've done with the Blackjack versus 21 issue, we're going to present written comments to you. Uh, we actually have a draft of those, and we expect to be presenting those in short order, and that will outline our views on the legal topics, the issues you've put before us. Of course, we're going to disagree with our the our tribal neighbors um, in that, and we're going to have very different views. We, um, we obviously have a different interpretation of the law. We have a different interpretation of continuous and systematic, and it's, you know, as you've seen before, if we can, if we want to, as you folks have just pointed out, that's not defined. And so, you know, in the extreme, it's Haley's Comet, as I've said before, but the reality is we need to find, uh, to, to dial that in. And then we obviously have a different interpretation of the Lytle letter and how it was presented and put forth. I would say to this group today, 
that you know our games are very different than the tribal games and just the fact that we offer the player de dealer position is substantially different and it's the difference between someone coming here and you folks talking to us today with a microphone and not letting anyone speak or as you've done opening it up to us so we can actually speak and present our issues. If you came into my card room in Fresno and asked it to wager on the player dealer position, we're gonna allow you to do that. And we're gonna allow you to do that in a regular fashion. If I tried to do that at Table Mountain Casino, 16 miles from me, that's, I'm not gonna be allowed to do that. They're fundamentally different games, what we play in our card rooms versus what's played in a commercial casino, a traditional commercial casino or the tribes. So we, with respect to the uh, what constitutes a game break uh, in looking and thinking about what we've written we probably need to address that a little bit better for you folks we did obviously talk through that when we went through the uh, the workshops to try to get to some sort of solution back in 2016 and we'll ha we'll take a closer look at that and i do believe we've addressed the <clears throat> what constitutes a bank game in the legal arguments and i would leave that to our um, legal staff members as you know we have we all have our own legal support, but we've also engaged at the Gaming Association, Munger Tolls, and others to help walk us through this. So expect to see written comments from us, and again, we appreciate the opportunity to talk today. Thank you. Hello, my name is Heather Garina, G-U-E-R-E-N-A. I'm the general counsel for Seven Mile Casino, the saloon at Stone's Gambling Hall, and the tavern at Stone's Gambling Hall. I'd like to join in the comments previously made by Mr. Freed, Mr. Sharp, and Ms. Harn at the Reading and Los Angeles workshops. For more than a decade, the Bureau's interpretation of Section 33011 appropriately resulted in the approval of game rules, where the opportunity to be the player dealer rotates amongst the participants, but does not require the offer to be accepted by every player. The Bureau should look to the rotation language and the various game approvals it has historically issued, as well as the game rules that have been approved prior to the enactment of the Gambling Control Act. To the extent the Bureau decides to alter any of the approved means for rotation and create regulations that are more restrictive, the Government Code 11346.2 requires the Bureau to explain why these reasonable alternatives are being rejected for more restrictive proposed regulations. Any proposed regulations must take into account the scope and intent of the authorizing legislation and construe the entire legislative scheme together so each sentence and related statute is read in harmony and no sentence is left to be superfluous. The plain language of section 33011 specifically states that the legislature did not intend to mandate acceptance of the deal by every player. Additionally, a review of legislative history establishes that earlier iterations of the proposed bill included requirements of for acceptance, which were deleted from the bill prior to enactment. The Bureau may not interpret the statute to impose restrictions that the legislation specifically excluded. No court has taken the position that if someone accepts the player-dealer position for more than two hands, this constitutes a prohibited banked game. Had the court interpreted the definition of a bank, taking all comers, paying all winners, and collecting from all losers, to mean a couple hands, the court would have said so. To the contrary, the Oliver decision specifically held that the possibility of a bank may only arise if there are repeated hands held by the same player for a long time. Any regulation proposing definition of a long time should determine it in hours and not in minutes. Additionally, when the position is offered, the participant who most recently held the player-dealer position cannot prevent any other player from accepting that position. The mere fact that another participant does not accept the position every time it is offered does not in itself make it a banked game. The Bureau must evaluate this option when crafting the regulations regarding what is a long time and what constitutes continuous and systematic rotation as intended by the legislature. Likewise, the Bureau can determine that the rules fall outside the established means of the bank, where the rules allow the player accepting the player-dealer position to choose how they wish to wager, 
irrespective of the other wagers placed by the other participants. The player dealer can only win or lose the amount they have chosen to wager. In many of the game approvals, we allow the players to bet $5, $100, irrespective of everyone else. And in that situation, that player dealer is not taking all comers, paying all winners, and collecting from all losers. Finally, I'd like to point out the reason that we have all of the economic impact to the community. Based on the public comments in Reading, Los Angeles, Antioch, and what you'll hear today in San Diego, it is clear that any regulations that change the way in which the Bureau approves games involving a player-dealer position will have an economic impact in California business enterprises that exceeds $50 million, which qualifies it as a major, major regulation under Government Code Section 11342.548. As such, the Bureau will also need to present information to explain how the regulation is going to impact the creation or elimination of businesses, how it's going to impact whether it is creating an advantage or disadvantage for this industry, whether it is increasing or decreasing the investment in the state, whether it is hindering the development and innovation within the industry, and whether the regulations actually benefit the state of California. Thank you very much. Good morning, thank you for uh, the workshop. I'm here, uh, my name is Daniel D. Rice. Um, I am a member of the community of Chula Vista. I'm also here representing the Us for Warriors Foundation. We are 100% nonprofit. But I'm also here as a United States Marine Corps veteran, and like I said, a member of the community who has worked very closely with Seven Mile Casino and other similar types of organizations in the community. A community is only as strong as its diversity, not only of people, but of industry. When you have an industry or a community that's diverse with uh, elements like Seven Mile Casino, which a previous lady very eloquently stated the positive impacts it has had in that community, we want to make sure you understand that us as a nonprofit organization depend on people like the Seven Mile Casino to make sure we get the funding so we feed thousands of military active veterans, their family, also help veterans that are in the streets, also veterans that need a helping hand, but we also work with other elements of the community. I happen to be with the Chula Vista Elks. We do a dictionary program where every third grader, not only in Chula Vista, but in San Isidro, Imperial Beach, National City, gets a dictionary. That comes from funds and the community help that someone like Seven Mile Casino <clears throat> provides for the community. So I'll leave the le I'm an educated man. I'll leave the legal lease and the politics to you to resolve and fix as a challenge. But don't impact Seven Mile Casino, it's what they do to the community, by putting adverse regulations that prohibit them from actually working and participating in our community. Make our community better, keep Seven Mile Casino a viable part of our co uh, community. Thank you. Good morning, Mark Collegian on behalf of Ocean's Eleven Casino, managing partner. Uh, we too, our casino, we rely upon the CGA's letter that will be forthcoming, that will be addressing the, the core legal issues, and we agree with what Kyle has said so far and Heather has said. I just wanted to point out a few additional uh, areas that I think require some, some emphasis. The law is very clear, and I'm not going to go into the legal history, as to the Bureau's past interpretation must be given great deference, okay? especially where the public has relied upon it, and especially when it's been a long-standing interpretation. Well, that's exactly what we have here. We've got rules that have been in place for 20 years. We have an entire industry that has developed around those rules. We have a segment of the public that relies on those rules and to come into our uh, card rooms to play these rules, to play these games under these rules. This is very important to take into consideration. 
Everyone has fear, obviously, in the card room sign that there's going to be some overreaction or all of a sudden we're going to go back to some, or we're going to fall into some rotation system or breaking of game system that is going to be dramatically different than where we are today. But look who's complaining. It's the tribes, and only the tribes. It's not the public. It's not the card rooms. It's not even the bureau. It's not any portion of the legislature or the government. It's one group that has a vested financial interest in seeing that we do not succeed. Uh, they're an $8 billion industry. You, I don't have to tell everyone all this. They're building hundreds of millions of dollars of expansions in their, in their casinos. When you weigh their interests and their concerns against the longstanding uh, operation of this industry under these sets of rules and the public's reliance, I think it's very clear that any changes to the law have to be measured, have to be reasonable, and have to, whenever possible, be in line and keeping with what's been done so far. And that's just, you know, it's not my opinion. It's really what the case law requires. It's what Section 11346.2 of the Government Code requires when it specifically says must be the least burdensome and equally effective regulations to accomplish the goal. Um, so that, that to me is, is, is one of the important points from a legal standpoint. The other point that I think gets overlooked, um, and it's by the tribes in particular, is the player dealer wagers whatever the player dealer wants to wager. There is no maximum, there is no minimum other than the table game minimum. So by definition, the player dealer is not taking on all comers, paying all winners, taking all, yeah, taking all losses. They're not, it's only up to whatever that player dealer wants to do. Don't, and don't think of it in terms of the TPPS sitting at the corner taking all. Think about it as Joe or Mary or Bill who wants to come up and, and act in the player-dealer position for any given hand at any given time. And that's what's important here. They have that opportunity at all times to step up. There is no preference. There is no priority for anyone else. Um, so the, the last issue I wanted to raise is with respect to when otherwise could an interpretation be made that a bank has been maintained. And we look to the Oliver case, which did not go the whole distance, but which did say it has to be held for a long time. Well, what does a long time mean? I think that's really, you know, if the Bureau is intent on examining these issues as they are and looking at what's a reasonable amount of uh, or what's a reasonable change to accommodate everyone's desires, you have to analyze what is a long time, okay? Now, the law in California does not define long time. We can't look it up and say, okay, but well, what does long mean? What does time mean? We can't do that. So we have to, as we do in the law, when we interpret, when we interpret these things, we look to the, to the dictionary, okay? So what do we have here? We've got games that are played 24 hours a day, okay? That's your period of time. That's your window of when a table can play a game. So we look to the definitions. De uh, Miriam Webster says, uh, extended over, defines a long time as extending over a considerable time, prolonged beyond the usual time, longer or lo long, larger or longer than the standard. A synonym under, Mer under the dictionary is elongated, extended, lengthy. But the most important thing to look at is what is a, a uh, antonym, and I have to remind myself what an antonym was, it means opposite, but what is an antonym for long time? Sh brief, curt, short, shortish. Okay, that's, under those definitions, any change to the amount of time should be viewed in terms of hours, multiple hours, because if you're looking at a 24 hour day, anything less would simply be uh, unfair to the industry and to the public that's relied upon it. Thank you very much. Good morning, my name is Jimmy Gutierrez. I'm an attorney, I represent the California Cities for Self-Reliance Joint Powers Authority, big words. I refer to it as California Cities, which for today is an apt description. I represented the California Cities since 2000 for 19 years now. And you know, we have to stop meeting like this. 
I think this is the third workshop that I've attended. And uh, I wonder why we're doing this. It almost seems unnecessary. It almost seems like there's a hidden plan. And in the connection, I want to just briefly uh, refer back to a case I tried some years ago when I was representing a city. Actually, I tried this in February of 2013. And in that case, the judge reminded me and reminded the other litigants in the case. He said, government exists to serve the people, not the people to serve government. You know, I've worked in representing government all my life, and I know most of you have too. And we have a duty as governmental officials. Some of us take an oath. I have taken several oaths. And our oath is to uphold the law, to uphold the Constitution, to protect people. And you as governmental officials are included in that realm of people who have that duty. And I think that you have a responsibility to explain why we are having these workshops. Let me start off with the obvious, and that is, you ask three questions. Those questions don't need to be asked. There's no need to ask those questions. It, if there is someone that has a question, point them to Penal Code Section 330 and Penal Code Section 330.11, which define all these issues. There's a standard there. Not only that, the California Gambling Control Con Commission has adopted regulations for third property excuse me, third, pop, third party proposition players, TPPs, which means in the re regulation state that if you have a third party proposition player, you've met the rotational requirement of Penal Code Section 330.11. It's legal to do. And those regulations provide, have a huge criteria, like 19 or 20 or 21 criteria to define what a third party proposition player is. They provide for review by the Bureau. They provide for review by the uh, uh, Gambling Control Commission. It's an extensive regulation that talks about how to do that as one component of compliance with the penal code. Again, we don't need to be here, and actually we shouldn't be here asking the question because the question is a legal question the courts have stated repeatedly that whether or not a gambling game complies with the statute is a legal question subject to the sole and exclusive jurisdiction of the courts. It is not an administrative determination. You as administrators do not have the authority to determine what is and what is not. As a matter of fact, the Gambling Control Act requires you to comply with the penal code, and it prohibits you from adopting rules on a statewide basis that would violate the penal code. So why are we here? In that connection, I think you have a duty to tell us at some point in time whether or not the Bureau has done any investigations about problems with the rotation, and if so, what are those problems? You have yet to tell us about any other problems with the rest of the regulations that you're talking about. If there are problems, you have the authority under the statute to enforce them. Why have you not enforced them? If there are violations, why have you not cracked down on the violators? And if you are proposing regulations, where are they? We're entitled to see them. We haven't seen them. But let me ask the final question. What is the impact of the Bureau's shutting down of lawful games played at licensed card clubs? All these games that are subject to scrutiny have been authorized at the local level, at the state level, the year level. You approve them. For example, I looked at the rules that are published on the Bureau's website for the Bicycle Club of Bell Gardens. There are 440 pages of rules I will remind you that a shutdown will result in a local government shutdown. One of our cities depends solely and exclusively on the revenue from it receives from its card club. It will go bankrupt. Another one will be on the verge of bankrupt, bankruptcy. That means cities will go down, 
people will not have services, and also many people like the ones here today will lose their jobs. So again, just remind you, you're here to serve the people. They're not here to serve you. If you have something of concern, bring it up. We're willing to help. I've made that offer before. We're here to help. Thank you. Hello, my name is Brian Altizer, I'm the owner of Napa Valley Casino. Um, so I said, this is the second workshop I've attended. The first one, I didn't speak. I just uh, listened and thought a lot about what was going on. So one observation I made is here's a large group of citizens making pleas to government regulators. Then I broke it down that regulators are here to protect the citizens against people who might want to do harm to them. And I thought this group of regulators here is representing the Attorney General of California, Honorable Xavier Bracera, a man whose administration is undoubtedly focused on standing up for the rights of the most vulnerable citizens in California, <clears throat> an administration that would want what is best for the people and families of this state. <clears throat> As I look around here in San Marcos, I see a lot of the same things, basically exactly the same thing that I saw in Antioch. Faces of the people that <clears throat> Mr. Becerra was elected to protect. Most are here in support of their jobs, their livelihoods, and their family's future. Others aren't here right now because they don't even know about the risk of losing this, the vital city services that they depend upon. Like, look, this is not the face of the Silicon Valley tech industry here. These are not faces of highly educated professionals who have easily replaceable jobs. But they're the faces of real people, proud people, who work hard to provide for their families. <clears throat> These are the faces of minorities, women, first-generation immigrants, whom have right now what they desperately need, a good living wage job with health care benefits. They're the faces of our neighbors, and a great many of these people will never replace the quality of life they have now if their jobs are eliminated. We're here because there's been undue pressure put on you as regulators. Pressure to reverse decades of precedent and to newly interpret regulations. Not to protect the public, but to reverse and reinterpret in a way that will severely harm all work, or these working families in California to benefit who? A tiny number of mega rich special interests tribal groups, and multinational casino corporations. You're being asked by those special interests to say that the previous attorney generals were all wrong. The Honorable John Vandekamp, the Honorable Dan Lundgren, the Honorable Bill Locklear, or Governor Jerry Brown, about United States Senator and possibly uh, presidential hopeful Kamala Harris. Were they all wrong? No, I don't think so. And the, and the wealthy special interests with their packs of lawyers and lobbyists, are they right? No, they're wrong, very wrong. We're blessed to live here in California where most of us agree is the greatest state in the country. But we have issues that are hurting their state right now. One in five Californians live below the poverty line. One third of all welfare recipients in the United States are neighbors here in California. This is a critical time in our state's history. Working class needs to be defended by the strong, defended against the evil greed that wishes to have you after almost 30 years rewrite laws so thousands of families will suffer just so a few mega rich special interests can become even more rich and powerful. These wealthy special interests and multinational casino corporations are attempting to use their CEOs, high powered executives, fast talking lawyers and elitist lobbyists to sell you snake oil by presenting what are false equivalencies as a disingenuous truth. 
They're attempting to use their granted monopoly in one specific area to infringe on the rights of citizens. This is something that the voters of California never imagined when they passed Prop 8 and Prop 5, 1A and Prop 5. <clears throat> As was mentioned earlier, take a look around this part of the state. Every tribal casino in this area has recently expanded its mega casino operations by adding new hotel towers, casino floor space, or amenities for its customers that could be only rivaled by Las Vegas. And they didn't suffer financially while they were expanding. They did it while enjoying record revenues and profits. They're now using those profits, uh, weapons to destroy, <coughs> to <coughs> weapons and distorting false equivalencies as facts in a vile attempt to overstep their monopoly and ruthlessly destroying families and vulnerable communities who are dependent on the card rooms. Why? So they can have more record profits again. So it comes back to you as the regulators to make a decision. Decisions about what's best for the people of the state of California. Do you want to side with wealthy special interests while watching vital city services and even cities themselves disappear? While tens of thousands of Californians Productive citizens, members of society are financially destroyed, put, on, and put out of work and onto welfare? Or do you want to be part of California's solution to, be, to keep our communities and tens of thousands of California families together with integrity? I know what the people of California want. Thank you, Mr. Um, we're going to go from the, the sign-in list, Ms. Lori Coons. My name is Lori Coons, that's C-O-O-N-S, and I am here uh, to share my personal experience with Seven Mile Casino Card Room, a neighbor to the Living Coast Discovery Seminar, Center, excuse me, which is a nonprofit zoo and aquarium that I work for. Um, not only has Seven Mile Casino been a philanthropic and supportive partner to our nonprofit, they have been a great neighbor, and it was mentioned earlier um, what they've done for our neighborhood. So as you may know, having a good neighbor is important to the Living Coast because it is located on a national wildlife refuge that brings in families and students to enjoy the outdoors and learn about our coastal environment. So to me, being a good neighbor, just like at your home, means they keep our shared streets clean, safe, and welcoming to families and students, as well as tourists that visit the San Diego area. Um, and we have had bad neighbors in the past, so I cannot tell you what a great feeling it is to have a business that cares about the neighborhood and is actively involved in our local community. And as I mentioned, I do work for the Living Coast and it is a nonprofit zoo and aquarium and uh, it is a protected area of land adjacent to the Seven Mile Casino card room. So we have over 85,000 visitors that come every year, including about 29,000 students, um, most um, at elementary school level that come through our doors to explore the nature trails and get up close with the wildlife. Um, and learn about our environment. And we have been there for just over 30 years in the city of Chula Vista, and we are very proud to be neighbors with Seven Mile Casino. So we hope that uh, Seven Mile Casino Card Room continues as they have been to bring community members to our neighborhood to enjoy the nearby amenities such as the Living Coast. And they have been a huge support to the Living Coast, and we are here to tell you that they are a great community partner. Thank you. Rob Gretz. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, my name's Rob Gretz, last name is G-R-E-T-Z. And I am with San Ysidro Health Center. Uh, San Ysidro Health is a nonprofit health center providing health care to those in need in the South Bay, El Cajon, and surrounding communities. We provide health care services to over 95,000 people annually. Seven Mile Casino has been very generous and supportive of our nonprofit organization. One example of how Seven Mile Casino supports us is the in-kind donation to use their facilities and hospitality, which we use to plan fundraising events. These fundraising events help our organization to fund programs and services for the community that are non-reimbursable under our normal funding. Without these generous donations, we would have to pay for meeting rooms elsewhere and would further complicate our planning processes. 
Any detrimental change to the games permitted at Seven Mile Casino could have a negative impact to Seven Mile Casino revenues and weaken their ability to support us and those like us in the same fashion. This would in turn have a negative impact on our organization and the communities that we serve. Thank you. Jack Feller. <clears throat> Pardon me. Jack Feller, Deputy Mayor of the City of Oceanside, the home of Oceans 11. Um, no, we don't get applause at, at our council meetings, so. Uh, <laughs> I know Mary Salas and I are, are both here representing the cause for uh, the, the cities, the basic uh, needs for this. This, this represents um, to us approximately six to seven police officers uh, in, in lost revenue, just just as a, a, a token. Um, our o Oceanside uh, businesses uh, will be disadvantaged. It puts our employees out of work. We have at least 350 employees uh, and 250 of them approximately live in Oceanside. Uh, it, it is a big deal for, for our residents. Uh, this uh, casino came into being from a small little, probably about the size of the front of this room. Uh, it took over an entertainment center uh, by being another en entertainment center, old bowling alley. And uh, it has improved the area, improved uh, the, the right of way. Um, it, it is a place where uh, the people that enjoy uh, the gambling, uh, best food in town, uh, it's, well, maybe the second best, but there is, uh, there is uh, an, an effort by uh, Ocean's Eleven to make a difference in our community. Uh, they've spent time uh, supporting our Museum of Art, um, uh, the Boys and Girls Club, Ivy Ranch, uh, Disabled Daycare Center, uh, these, these people put their uh, money where their mouth is as far as uh, being part of a community. Um, we have uh, rules for the table games and, and it's been approved by you. Um, I, I hope you take that into consideration. Um, when, when, uh, when I go in, I, I, it, it is a safe place to recreate for, for our, uh, uh, not only for our employees, but our, for all the people. And there is n nothing near us for 40 miles uh, for uh, uh, this type of recreation to, to make it back into a card room that is just simply this small is, is really unfair to the, the citizens and the community uh, that enjoys this recreation. Uh, they, they, they've committed an awful lot to the city of Oceanside. Uh, they, they make a difference and, and as the other gentleman said, it, it could make a difference in the number of police officers we can uh, provide for. Um, those are things that need to happen. I don't know about the, uh, how that player dealer thing works. Uh, personally, I'd, if I had the money, I'd like to sit there and just be a dealer every other, every, you know, take that dealer button, but uh, I don't have the money for that. So uh, make a rule that's fair for all of us and fair to, uh, the citizens, the, the community that lives and works there. So, thank you. Scott Ashton.
Good morning. My name is Scott Ashton. I'm the CEO of the Oceanside Chamber of Commerce, and I appreciate the opportunity um, to speak on behalf of Ocean's Eleven Casino this morning. Ocean's Eleven has been part of the Oceanside community for several decades and currently provides close to 400 jobs for the citizens of Oceanside in North San Diego County. In the past five years alone, they have paid nearly $6 million in city gaming fees and taxes, not to mention their support of local charities, community events, and community organizations. Um, as an example, Ocean's Eleven has been a supporter of two of Ocean's, uh, the Oceanside Chamber's largest events. Um, the first is Oceanside Heroes, which recognizes our Oceanside police, fi uh, firefighters, lifeguards, and teachers. And they are also um, supporters of our Armed Forces Day Operation Appreciation event, which provides support and recognition for thousands of local military families. Ocean's Eleven has been a good partner and neighbor in our community, and in my 22 years at the Chamber, I cannot recall ever receiving a single complaint about this business. It is rare to have a business that is able to provide sustainable support to their community in terms of, in terms of jobs for its residents and support for key community organizations and events. I urge you to take these factors into consideration in any decisions that you are making that would impact Ocean's Eleven's uh, ability to continue to provide positive support for the Oceanside economy and the city services that so many of our residents depend on. Thank you for your time. Esther Sanchez. Okay. Thank you so much. Steve Schreiner. Good morning, and thank you Hope, for hosting this workshop. I'm Steve Schreiner, S-C-H-R-E-I-N-E-R. -E I'm the uh, designated agent on behalf of Lake Elsinore Hotel and Casino. Uh, I'm going to be very brief, uh, partly because I'm mindful of the number of people uh, behind me that would like to speak, and partly because a lot of what I would have said has already been said in a manner much more articulate than I can express. Uh, in particular, with respect to the legal issues that were addressed during the, uh, the first portion of the program, uh, I would defer to the, uh, the submission that's, that either has been made or will be made by the California Gaming Association. I've seen a draft of it. Uh, my client and I heartily concur with everything that's in there, and also with the comments that were made by Mr. Kirkland, by uh, Mark Collegian, and by Heather Garena. Uh, I, I am an attorney, but uh, I will defer the legal analysis to CGA and to the people that have already spoken. What I do want to say uh, also echoes some of what we've heard from the uh, uh, Stones folks and the, uh, the Oceanside folks, and that is uh, Lake Elsinore Casino has been in existence for over a quarter of a century. It employs well over 100 individuals, uh, most or all of whom live in the Lake Elsinore, Murrieta, and uh, Temecula areas. Uh, it has a tremendous impact on the economies in those areas, even though it's, uh, by relative standards, a, a fairly small card room. And as I was driving up here today, uh, I was listening to the radio, listening to NPR, and the, almost all of the programming had to do with the federal partial shutdown and the work furloughs of federal employees. And there was a lot of focus on the hardship that those individuals were suffering. If if the Bureau ultimately adopts the uh, position with respect to the player-dealer rotation that the tribes are advocating, that is effectively what's going to happen to the 127 people that work for Lake Elsinore and a lot of people that are sitting behind me in this room. And I don't think that that is something that should be allowed to happen uh, lightly and without extremely good reason. Um, that that sort of furlough would not be a matter of days or weeks like we hope the federal furlough will be. It'll be a matter of months, years, or for some of these people, permanent unemployment. So thank you for hearing me. David Lee.
Good morning. Uh, my name is David Lee, L-E-E. -E. I work for Night Adventures, a third party provider. So before this, uh, I worked for as a mattress delivery driver, and I had no college experience. Um, I had resigned myself to entry level jobs. And when looking for a new career, I found Knighted, which uh, paid pretty well, didn't require any prior experience, and required no college degree or any kind of management experience. Um, I moved to Los Angeles for this job, and it has provided me an opportunity to take care of my wife and my infant daughter, uh, Ava. My, I've been with Knighted for about five years, and over the past five years, it has given me continuous opportunities for growth and learning, um, and given me the opportunity to provide that for new hires as well. Um, this story is not unique to me in that there are somewhere between 20 and 25,000 employees in our industry who all have similar um, entries into it. Um, I, one of the benefits of my personal job is that I get to meet most of the new hires for our company in Southern California. And one of my favorite questions to ask them is, what are you working towards? And I get to meet people who use this the nature of this industry to work nights so they can spend the days with their families or so that they can go to school and pursue a career in their chosen industry. And um, another aspect of it is that I get to give back to the community. Last week, I was able to go to two different food banks. One uh, was the LA Regional Food Bank and help provide and sort food for families in need. I also got to go to one in Ventura through Knighted. And next week, I get to go to one out in Bakersfield. My main concern is that any sort of negative impact on our industry will take away from the individuals and the, the, our industry's ability to give back to the communities. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Mark Collegian. He signed in twice. <laughs> Mark Legion, Ocean's Eleven. I just wanted to briefly say a couple of things. You know, I, I know you've heard this, I don't want to say spiel, but you've heard from citizens throughout the state. I mean, it's not a, no one's message here is new, but it is personal to them. And I think that's what's important and that's what we need to take away from all these speakers who are coming up. You know, I look at, I look at my Ocean's Eleven team that's here. We've got about 70 people here. Um, you know. I thank them for coming, but the one point I want to make about who they are, they're not just dealers. I've got, I see maintenance people, porters, housekeeping, kitchen, uh, cage people, dealers, floormen. The entire casino is affected by what happens in, in these regulations. And so I wanted to make sure that that impact, you know, is, is truly appreciated and that it's not simply, oh, well, you're going to lose a few games, you're going to lose a few dealers. No, we'd lose hundreds of jobs throughout the casino all the way across. I know we all see estimates of 25,000 or so employees, but you know you have to multiply that and look at the families that are affected by those employees. And you're probably going to be well over 100,000, 200,000 people that would be affected by, the, by any drastic changes to the law. Um, I know your job is tough. I know you're taking a lot of grief. Um, you know, we, we, we just we want to advocate patience and, 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 and not going too far away from where we are today. Um, and I want to thank you guys for coming down. Appreciate it. Thank you. Susanna Sheehan. My name is Susanna Sheehan, um, S-U-S-A-N-N-A-S-H-E-E-H-A-N, -N -E -E and I have been lucky enough to work for Night Adventures for six years. Um, while I'm concerned about the reasons, I do want to say thank you for being here, and thank you for holding these public workshops across the state. The California card room industry and its impact is not widely known at all. I had no idea what I was getting into six years ago. I had never heard of it. Um, but it is critical 
to so many citizens and so many communi communities across the state. These workshops um, are at the very least giving these people a voice. Um, to those of us who are, un who are most impacted by these unnecessary additional regulations. The narrative so far has been shaped by large corporations and special interest groups who have benefited from their relative size to portray us negatively, to you, to, to legislators, and to the general public. Um, they call us fraudulent. I saw one person call us, quote, the underbelly of gaming. Well, I have something to say about that. Growing up, I lived pretty comfortably. Um, I, with a lot of support from my family, from my community, I got good grades in school and was lucky enough to attend Stanford University in Palo Alto. Um, that was really intimidating. I was surrounded by extremely high caliber people uh, in, in my classes. One of them was recently elected to be the first African mayor of Stockton and also the youngest mayor ever of Stockton. Um, another went on to found Snapchat. Another one was the number one overall NFL draft pick. All of this is to say that I quickly got used to being surrounded by people who are way more hardworking, way more driven, way more intelligent and th than I am. But I can tell you honestly that I have never met more hardworking, driven, intelligent, kind, and high integrity people than I have from working in the California card room industry. Um, Every day, these people push me to be better, to contribute more to the community, um, and to make a bigger impact. Their integrity is unmatched, and many of the people that I credit with being where I am today are sitting here in this room. These people are my family, this industry is my livelihood, and it's my home. Once again, I want to thank you for giving all of us a voice through these meetings. I hope that through these workshops, we've helped to push back against the negative stereotype that these outside groups are pushing to further their own financial interests. This isn't a question of existence for these groups, but it is for us, and you can see that by the representation at these workshops. I hope that you'll take all of us Californians who rely on these jobs and do a darn good job uh, before you make changes that threaten our livelihoods. We have coexisted for a long time. We can continue to do so. And all we're asking is that we are allowed to continue to do so. Thank you. Bronson Scott. My name is Bronson Scott, B-R-O-N-S-O-N-S-C-O-T-T. -T. Uh, I just have a story to share about my experience working in the card club industry. I work for Night Adventures as well uh, at a card club up in Bell Gardens, California. I just started dating a girl in the card club industry as well. And uh, not just her, but like her, several of her relatives too. Like if you've ever seen Game of Thrones, like her whole family tree is like the Starks. They're like taking over the casino we work in. Like her brother works there. Uh, her sister works there as well as her sister's boyfriend. They have a one and a half year old daughter. She doesn't work there yet, but uh, give it a couple decades, you know, she might, she might. But uh, <laughs> she also has a few cousins that work there as well. Uh, her and her siblings have a unique situation though. Tragically, they, they like, lost one of their parents when they were young. Uh, he was killed and their mother is in rehab right now. So they all live together, her, her brother, her sister, her sister's boyfriend and their little daughter. And all of them now work at this, at this casino, at this card club. So their, uh, their livelihood and their prosperity is dependent on this industry and on this company. And, in this job now, it's provided a life for them and now like the next generation coming in. It's really, it, it means a lot to them. And I know any, uh, any changes to the rotation could negatively impact them and now they're like their whole family. So I know there's a, there's a lot to consider, 
I don't envy your position. This is a lot to think about, and this will definitely affect the way business is done for the next several decades. We just ask that, please, you consider us when making your decision. Consider these stories and consider us, and I trust that you'll make the decision that's most right. Thank you. Beatrice Sanieto. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to get to stand before you and speak today. My name is Beatrice Sarmiento, and I'm the director of the Public Library in the City of Commerce here in California. I'm here today to encourage the Bureau to continue to support car clubs and in doing so, support families that benefit from great community partners. In my case, in my city, it is the Commerce Casino. The games you want to change with new reg regulations have been played for over 20 years. Why look into changes now that could adversely affect communities like mine? The Commerce Casino is a vital community partner to thousands of people that reside in the City of Commerce. The Commerce Casino supports local programs that benefit families all year round. And I can honestly tell you, when I've asked for something for library programs for our community, they have never once told me no. One important program is the City of Commerce Scholarship Program. Since 1986, the Commerce Casino has donated thousands to help Commerce residents attain a college degree. Hundreds of students have been able to attend college and earn a degree because of the direct monetary help provided by the Commerce Casino. Since the inception of this program, their donations total close to $1 million. In a community where almost half of our residents over 18 don't have a high school diploma, many are first in their families to attend college and lack the financial resources needed. As a library, we provide informational resources to these students, but we cannot cover the cost of college. To take away the ability for car clubs to help bridge the economic and most importantly, the equity gap in communities like mine can cripple it and hinder the success of its residents, and that is just wrong. The library also hosts family programs that are beloved and important to our community. One such program is the annual family holiday program. In my city, programs that bring families together are very, very meaningful. Every year, close to 200 people come, and some dressed in their Sunday best. The smiles on the kids' faces warm every heart. The Commerce Casino provides lunch for the families, and it makes this event extra special. Commerce is a low to middle income community, a community of people of color. Many families cannot afford to go to the Hollywood Bowl or to the Walt Disney Concert Hall for a holiday program, but they can come to their library and celebrate the holidays and enjoy a meal as a family. If car clubs like the Commerce Casino were to be hindered in how they do business, that would have direct effect on the communities in which they reside, and that is what we are talking about here. There are hardworking people that live in our communities, and they do the best they can to provide for their families but they need help of organizations like libraries and community partners like the Commerce Casino. I truly believe in abundance, and when you can give to others, you do it, and the benefits of generosity are enormous, and we've heard many stories here today. That is what the Commerce Casino means to the people of the City of Commerce. Please don't take that away. There is no other business in our city that is generous like they are. Who would pick up the shortfall? How would kids not go to college or at least feel like they have a community behind them, including the Commerce Casino? In my short time before you, I urge you to think about the communities like mine and all that would be lost should we not have a great community partner because they are like very good friends. They are very hard to come by. Thank you. Mayor Mary Salas. Good morning. Welcome to beautiful San Diego County. I'm Mayor Mary Casillas Salas, the mayor of the city of Chula Vista. My only wish is that you have the opportunity to visit my beautiful city where Seven Miles Casino is located. Um, but I'm here to speak in support of Seven Mile uh, Casino, which is located in our city. 
Seven Mile Casino is an outstanding corporate citizen. Seven Mile has become an integral part of our community, graciously lending their facility for community events, generously supporting city events such as Harbor Fest, the State of the City Address, Fourth of July Fest, the Starlight per Parade, and our Ribbons and Shovels Award Ceremony. In addition, Seven Mile also supports many of our local nonprofit organizations. Seven Mile Casino is a good employer offering good paying long term jobs with benefits. The jobs it offers are unique in that they do not require a college degree or work experience. In fact, many of these jobs pay very well so that residents in our community can care for their families on this income or even purchase a home. Seven Mile Casino, located in a very blighted area of the city of Chula Vista. The improvements that they've made are remarkable in the beautiful remodel of, the, of an old shut down restaurant. But in addition to that, they purchased an old strip club and shut it down. And in addition to that, they also purchased a CD hotel and remodeled it so that it'd be a place where any family would want to, would want to visit. In addition to that, since they've been there, that area of Chula Vista has experienced a, a tremendous uh, reduction in calls for service from our police department and a reduction in, in crime. I am here to tell you today that anything that you would do that would result in reducing revenues from the card rooms have a real direct impact on all the residents of our city, including the loss of jobs and the revenues that we need for vital services and economic activities. I also want to let you know that I'm a former member of the California State of Assembly, so I know what a huge political influence the gaming tribes have. I can't see that how the limited amount of gaming offered in card rooms are any kind of competition or any threat to tribal, to tribal gaming. Uh, I just can't understand the push for these um, restrictive re regulations, and I certainly ask for your consideration. Thank you very much. Suzanne Linder. She's on her way. And I believe the mic comes off the stand, if you'd rather okay. hold it. Can you hear me? Can I, you, okay. Well, I'm not gonna hold it, I'm not gonna be able to. First of all, I wanna know if, uh, how many people are aware of craps, and if, it, if they are, have, uh, they think it's Indian gaming. I wanna see how many hands think that it's Indian gaming. How many hands? I'm sorry, Ms. Mal I don't think that they heard your question. Okay. I wanted to find out if people, when they hear the, the word of playing craps, it's, it's considered Indian gaming. How many people, can I see a show of hands? Okay, okay. I just wanted to briefly cover the history of what we have done to assert our rights as the lawful owners of craps uh, played with cards. Our lawyers and law firms representing our case told us that we needed to get the laws changed because Native American casinos are immune through sovereignty, uh, through sovereignty, through sovereignty of prosecution. You cannot sue them. So what we did is uh, they told us to talk to our senator, Senator Diane Feinstein, to get the laws changed or revised. We contacted De uh, Senator Feinstein, among others. Her office told us to contact Olin Jones of Indian Affairs, who told us to co that we needed to contact Daniel Ackerman, United States Congress, I'm sorry, United States Attorney General, who told us to contact the FBI, who told us they don't do that, and sent us to a special uh, um, agent in charge, uh, Kevin Kolb, who then referred us to a mystery Trejo of the Department of Justice of Gambling Division. 
More recently, we contacted Senator Harris, the uh, ACLU, um, uh, let's see, the Patent Office, uh, they have uh, infringement people that you could speak to, and uh, also some news stations, one complaint about Pichanga's advertising craps game. They have never owned a craps game. We are the holders of the craps patents. We have three patents, one um, um, copyright and uh, uh, what's it called, a um, trademark. Our game is called California Dice. They, have, they are playing, okay, we are being discriminated against by these Native American casinos. They are using their immunity to lawsuits to break the law. It's unethical and unfair business practice to do these things, like infringing patents because, just because they can get away with it. They are not only using, they are not only, not only are the casinos cheating us, but they are cheating the casino businesses as well as local communities by preventing them from getting, uh, preventing them from collecting revenue, employment opportunities and that is generated by these and which in turn benefit the community. It is unfair. As you can see, I'm a disabled person. I have to live off of, off of disability and I hold three patents. How many do you guys have? How many can you, we should be able to collect our royalties, the minimum, our royalties. This is unfair and we'd like to know if you guys can do something about it. Thank you. Yes. Ali Reza Piruska. <laughs> she was a little stolen. I Hello. couldn't read your writing, sorry. Good morning. My name is Ali Reza Piruska, P-I-R-O-U-Z-K-H-A-H. -H. I'm employee of Commerce Casino for 34 years. Actually, when I moved to California, my first job at the Commerce Casino, Commerce Casino got me without knowing any knowledge of the gaming or any dealing. They helped me. I've been there with them for 34 years. After several years, I invented California Dice, playing a crap game with the cards. My co-worker, co-inventor, Susan Melendez, we did, we did, we, we introduced this game to Saboba Casino in 2004. They trained all their dealers for three, four months. They told me if I have different color of the cards, we, they love the game, they want a game, they want to train their dealer. I rush order another few different color of the deck of card. So back and forth, they had a the live, live, they uh, advertised live game, grand opening, all those stuff. But Chief, Chief Delgado, I believe, Delgado, they want some kind of the under the table business with me, which I, Deny it. They want money. They want 25% the of this game goes anywhere else. I said no. So they said they don't want this game. Their gaming commissioner approved both of us for the, the they give us the license that we are approved to deal with the band of the, the Saboba Casino. So they said we don't need this game. Suddenly everywhere they have the different craps game, play with the cards. We got the lawyer, at our attorney, they said, your first patent is not enough. We got two more patents on this game. The last one issued on 2016, which is apparatus. That means any casino, any tribe, any Indian casino playing a craps game with involving any cards, they are infringing our patent. Unfortunately, we cannot do anything. We cannot sue them. We have all this patent, we pay all the money for the lawyers and all these people to get it, go by the law. And we did everything we could, but unfortunately we cannot do anything. Still, I am a commerce casino dealer. I have not much money. 
I don't know what to do with it. We did everything. We contact Diane Feinstein. She sent us everywhere. It takes two or three years. Yeah. We follow all those recommendations. All those offices that Indian affair game, they all said we cannot give you any advice. I did not ask for advice. I did not ask for legal advice from any of them. All I want to know why I cannot sue the, any casino that they're playing that infringe in my game. That's my concern. How come I cannot sue? This is, this is not another country. This is not China. This is not another country that they are infringing my patent. This is just our backyard. And we going, I made this game for California card room because they play with the card. They had a blackjack. I thought, how come we don't have a, a craps game? I create the craps game with the card. They play exact same with the deck of card that I created. So now the suits come for a bidding also, so add more to the regular craps game. I go to the card room to market this game. They say, oh, this is the Indian gaming. Oh, we can't touch it. This is the Indian gaming. This is not the Indian gaming. Paula Casino with over 100 lawyer name on their patent, they tried to get the patent for a gaming, for an Indian gaming. They could not, they did not. Patent office, they did not give them the patent. They give us the patent because I was the first person to invent this game. And thank you very much for you guys listening to us. I hope you guys do something and you guys give us the right way that what can, what can we do to solve this problem? You're they, missing out on millions of dollars. They think it's a game so for them, but it's not. This is our game and they are infringing. Thank you very much. Uh, if you want to see the game, Lynette Tessitone. Good morning, honorable bureau members. Thank you for the opportunity to speak this morning. My name is Lynette Tessitore, L-Y-N-N-E-T-T-E, Tessitore, T-E-S-S-I-T-O-R-E. I am the culture arts manager and a resident of City of Chula Vista, and I'm here in support of Seven Mile Casino and the work that they do both as a business in Chula Vista and as a community partner. Seven Mile Casino is an amazing community partner. Their monetary in-kind and overall general sustainable support assist in providing opportunity, access, and connection to arts and culture programs for many that otherwise would not have them. Whether it's hosting a fundraising event, financial support of a signature community event, or the simple provision of water for a community build, Seven Mile Casino is always there. Most recently, Seven Mile Casino donated financial support to a community mural that will not only be a placemaking landmark for our community, but the entire South Bay region, and it will assist in saving the city and taxpayers thousands upon thousands of dollars that are currently spent eradicating constant graffiti on this thousand foot wall. This is just one of the numerous, and there are really too many to count, ways that Seven Mile contributes to the quality of life in the city of Chula Vista. The city of Chula Vista is the second largest city in the county of San Diego, but we're a strong connected community, and Seven Mile Casino is a part of our diverse social and economic fabric. Seven Mile and every single one of their employees is an integral part of what makes us who we are as a safe, healthy, connected community. The potential loss of that would be detrimental to our entire, entire community. I ask that you not impose restrictions that would have significant negative impact on our community, and thank you for your consideration. Okay, we are going to take a five-minute break, uh, reconvening at 10.50. Uh,